All right, good evening. Uh, we have a uh, meeting to call to order. First item would be to adopt the agenda to one later and it's published. Second. And second, all those in favor? All those carried? As everyone here uh, knows, we lost uh, one of our former mayors this uh, past Friday. And I'd like council to join me in observing uh, a minute of silence for the late Jim Grass. Thank you. I know that uh, Jim would want us to move on uh, with this meeting, and, and I know that uh, many of you will be at his uh, celebration of life service here on Saturday. I'm going to take you out to Rex Rec Center and uh, have an opportunity to express our condolences to Sue and family. On a slightly more happy note, um, I just wanted to make note that uh, one of our local young people, uh, Comox golfer, age 22, Riley Wielden, uh, won his uh, First Canadian Professional Golf Association Tour event up at uh, Portland Murray this past weekend in the Century uh, Boreal Open. So congrats, Riley. I know that uh, many of you know Riley, and uh, he's on his way to hopefully getting a tour card on the big tour. So that's going to happen for him. Yeah, he was pretty much assured he'd be getting the open. The open, that's right. So we'll see him on TV soon All right, so we'll move on with the rest of the meeting. We, uh, we have no delegations this evening. We do have minutes of meetings for approval for June 19th, the regular council meeting minutes. Move we'll receive. <coughs> okay. Approval then. Any questions? All those in favor? Motion is carried. And then for receipt, we do have a holding of minutes of June 26th. Move. Second. And receive then. All those in favor? Motion is carried. We do have uh, committee recommendations regarding the first house that were approved at the committee level. Uh, I'm not going to read them all out, but one through eight could be moved. I believe that uh, we're going to be discussing the actual bylaws and the yeah. new business. So we uh, item H. So I think that would be the best place to do that. So we're giving the formal readings at that point. This is just taking the committee recommendation of this meeting. All the data? It's carried. Uh, no committee reports. So we have the management report for receipt, page 19. Move receipt. And all those in favor? It's carried. Uh, CAO, uh, CAO, we're well on the way to the organic collection. And then I guess we put uh, it Done some more work on the uh, final grants. So we'll yes, the, uh, the survey is complete. The plan has been prepared in terms of uh, these uh, woods. Uh, it's been signed by our approving officer and sent back to the province to the survey general. And uh, it's in their hands now. The province, so we should be doing it shortly. Okay. Uh, in terms of the organic waste collection, there were a couple members of council. And then some staff that uh, went to the uh, processing facility at the Pigeon Lake today. And we can report on that later. Okay. I'm just curious if the grading system, the community on the organic waste, are some residents getting it? Do you understand? Any comments coming along? I haven't heard any directly. We, we do know that uh, the estimates that we have are that. Uh, Approximately 20 tons of material has been delivered so far with the program um, just in its infancy. And, and we do know that there needs to be more take up of the program. But uh, Michelle can also, she's been tracking in terms of what the volumes are of uh, landfill and product that's going in and uh, how successful it will be in a little more time. Okay. That's 20 times, so that's actually more than we used to have. 
yards we installed somewhere else, so we eliminated that. And we're able to quantify 20 tons of organic spill. No, I, I, I believe, Shelly, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's the volume of garbage that's decreasing going across the scale. Oh, okay. it's not organic, so it's, it's what's coming down in terms of the volume of garbage. Okay. And uh, obviously, on the crown end, the final step once subdivision is occurred is the actual open tax. Yeah. arrange once we know that's happened for assignments and other steps. Okay, so we'll move on to the annual report. Uh, this was received from the whole on June 26th, and it's basically here now for uh, final approval. I don't know if there are any comments from members of the public, those advertised as required. Or any further comments from members of the council? And then a motion to approve would be a move. in favor? Thank you, staff, for putting that together. All right, so we have some minutes of regional district meetings, uh, regional district board, hospital, and cell waste. All for approval. Approval. Okay. Approval then. All those in favor? So under new business, then we'll have. Uh, First item, which is for 2113 Bambus Place, mm -hmm. development variance permit related to a secondary suite. Recommendations from staff or the issuance of that permit. Mm -hmm. Second. Second. Any discussion on that permit? Hearing none, all those in favor? Motion's carried. And at page 141, we have a uh, report from planning regarding the development variance permit application. Street, and again, the staff recommendation of which one subject to the condition the payment schedule. So, it's a fact. Second, any discussion? Any men? All those in favor? And then we also have a flight plan and function application for the 1933 Taylor Avenue, so on page 159. Staff are recommending that the exemption be issued upon completion of the external warning system in schedule 1. Move. Second. Second, we have a discussion. Uh, with the um, archaeology that is between the province and the African and then turn to the uh, from the province so we have more involvement in that in that area. And I, I take it to that um, although there's an engineering report saying um, there isn't going to be a problem with uh, with acting the floodplain. We would we would have the liability that would not go to the engineering uh, firm. Uh, uh, same question. I yeah. suppose we're planning. Because that's that's what it would be. The uh, engineers do make conceptual analysis in, in the state engineer statement saying it's uh, safe and suitable. At the very least, it's safe and suitable, and that would provide uh, uh, a level of uh, Protection in terms of liability from the campus and we rely upon the federal engineer certified, um, certified uh, report. And that's why we specifically um, do require that term of safe and suitable in the report. Okay, thank you. And, uh, and just on the two trees mentioned, do we have any control over over whether the trees are there or not anyway? That you would mention that uh, the sequoia. Oh, in their letter, uh, they mentioned that uh, all written the sequoia tree that uh, um, they're looking at with that maybe will stay and maybe won't. Is this anything that we would have any control over? Or have you had any thoughts for you? So, so I'm not checking on the trees that are on the property. Okay. So I'm not checking on the trees that are on the property. Okay. In regards to the variance itself, um, the council is restricted to matters that have by the in terms of conditions, conditions that are directly related to the variance payment. So there's nothing, there's no relationship between the uh, variance on the public exemption and protecting the tree. At the same time, um, the property owners um, have been more than accommodating and interested in terms of uh, taking actions to protect the trees. Um, so they are, um, in terms of following the best management practices on the site, um, very willing. Indications indicate that they can't save the trees uh, while accommodating their development activities. Great, so they are looking at fencing and 
and following those procedures, they're aware that that because of the best outcome is expected. Um, they um, mm -hmm. will they um, in theory they will be contacting the markers. Great, thank you. Any further? Seeing none, all those in favor? This is good. All right, so at this time, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Erica Arnton, who's a planning student this summer, and she has been doing lots of work in the planning department, and this is one of her projects. And she's going to give us a presentation on the uh, vehicle and bicycle parking calculation. So, welcome, Erica. Thank you very much for having me. So, uh, we have to connect and start up. So, as you've seen in the report I uh, submitted, I did give you guys an example of how the uh, parking tool will operate. So, what I'm just going to give you a quick uh, view now is seeing it actually uh, what it's going to look like. And so, our hope is to then implement this in the development uh, application process and on um, the municipal website. So you've gotten a printout of uh, this example uh, here. So this is what the blank template will resemble. So an applicant coming forward uh, will be able to then take the information from their application, being the areas for the specific uses they're proposing, and add those directly to this uh, tool. So it's operated within Microsoft Excel, and it's very uh, simple uh, to use. So under the areas category, uh, an applicant would be able to add the specific information. And so many of the uses that are currently listed in the zoning bylaw are, uh, are all found here. And so it's alphabetical. Uh, you go through and look for which use you're proposing, be it a new dwelling or a film theater or any of these listed here. And as a result, the total uh, number of parking spaces would appear here along the bottom. We're also, in, in, uh, with this tool, looking at calculating bicycle parking spaces. Because our bylaw does offer applicants the opportunity to reduce the number of vehicle parking spaces that are required based on the number of bicycle parking spaces that are provided. So if you meet the bylaw's recommended minimum, then you can turn around and receive a reduction in the vehicle parking. So step two, the sheet uh, looks at what, how many uh, bicycle parking spaces are being proposed and then a possible reduction is being granted. So as the spreadsheet is currently blank, um, zero is being a return here. Uh, we have uh, separated out uh, parking for restaurants as a separate uh, step in this sheet because it is calculated differently in the bylaw. So for restaurants within downtown, if the necessary bicycle parking is provided, we allow the restaurant to remove all of its vehicle parking. So that's taken into account here in the spreadsheet. For restaurants that are located outside of the downtown area, bylaw allows for a reduced parking rate at either a 1 to 40 square meters of, uh, of per parking space or 1 to 20 square meters um, based on the size of the restaurant and that cutoff being at 500 square meters. So what the tool does is at this point uh, it'll tell you what rate of parking, be it at 1 per 6 seats if you're not meeting your bicycle, or any of those previous uh, parking rates I've described, and then the total number of spaces based on that parking rate provided. The next two steps are for accessible parking spaces and uh, loading spaces. So again, this looks at what the bylaw requires. So for the bylaw at this stage for accessible parking spaces, we require uh, one accessible parking space if you are required to have between 10 and 50 standard parking spaces. So the bylaw, uh, the tool will take the information from the bylaw and then return in this box here whether or not one space is required. If you're over 50 uh, parking spaces, the accessible parking spaces are then enforced through the building code. So the, the tool does kind of direct you to that saying, okay, you will be required to meet that through the building code, not through the zoning bylaw. The final step is for loading spaces, and that's based on the area of use provided, and that's only for uses that fall within the industrial or commercial zone. So it, the tool is actually capable, based on the zone that is added in this step, it's capable of determining if you're in a commercial or industrial zone, and then stating that if a loading space is required. So it's not on the applicant to decide, well, am I in commercial, am I in industrial, it does that for them. The final page of the uh, tool is in the summary, in which you can, the applicant can put in their address and which project they're referring to, and all of the information from the spreadsheet is all located on this final page. So the hope is that integrating this into uh, the application process, uh, staff can then have a quick review of what uh, an applicant's considered for their parking requirements, are they meeting it, are they not, and then um, can look at if they are eligible for reductions based on bicycle. 
Okay, sounds quite uh, comprehensive. Yeah. Any questions? Any questions at all? All right. Well, thank you, and I assume the planning department is going to put that on the line as quickly as possible. Yes. Right. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> there is a recommendation here that council directs staff to implement that uh, as outlined here in the application process on our website. Move. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Yes. Good. Alrighty, so moving on, page 209, our director of finance has given us uh, a report uh, that we to receive on the effect of the BC Utilities Commission to receive more of the gas. Second. All those in favor? Yes. Any discussion about it, Bobby? Yeah, it was interesting. I, I didn't realize that we actually made money um, from indirectly from gas sales. So that uh, is a different complexion on it. I guess the economy and the community are the ones who would benefit if we did have that one rate across BC. And I know in the Nanaimo example, Nanaimo found that they would have had a large bus savings, but they perhaps didn't cost in that factor. It's very difficult to notice. Um, could we send this to ABICC? Because at the moment there is an appeal going on uh, to, uh, to attempt to get the uh, postage stamp rate, the, the one rate across BC. So I think this would be a useful report, and it certainly shows what uh, impact on our economy and impact on the town. So, yeah. Sure, I mean, you could just, if you're on board, so we can take it to you. Do you look for a counseling in this week? It would be good. I think okay. it would be a motion to receive and refer to the ABICC. Move. Second. All those in favor? Motion's good. Thank you. Thank you for sharing this. How often does this BC Utilities Commission need to discuss these things? Do we know? I don't. I know that uh, they meet you know, on many issues, but uh, their appeal process, I think, is kind of on. It's obvious that uh, there's a lot of pressure on them from mm -hmm. the, you know, the mainland, not every, not to accept this because. Yeah, and I think the uh, EBLCC has been working closely with Forest Gas on what's mm -hmm. discussed the last mm -hmm. two EBLCCs. Mm -hmm. And no doubt it will be discussed for mm -hmm. So, the BBCM will be talked to the support from the BBCM. Yeah. Certainly a benefit to the now. Yeah. All right, we'll see where it goes. Thank you, uh, I'm sure Barbara will have to use. Thank you. EBLCC level. All right, uh, then we also have a report from our director of finance on the uh, installments for the contract to that. All right, uh, on receipt, then all in favor? Motion's carried. And you'll see there there is an appeal process underway with respect to uh, air traffic control towers, as you may recall, that was uh, an issue in other parts of BC, along with ferry terminals. So we'll see what happens with that. Okay, and then our town engineer is provided us with an update on the road resurfacing program. Move. Second. Receive that. All those in favor? Motion's carried. Certainly lots of work underway and still going on. Um, the report is relatively satisfactory. Any comments here? No. Okay. We'll move on then. Okay, so this is uh, the next item is post houses. So uh, there's a series of recommendations, and um, staff are asking for first readings and meeting plan, I think, as well as it's only about one and the second, but perhaps uh, Councilor Swift, you would like to have uh, the floor for a moment? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm still confirming that this tree protection piece of this bylaw, uh, which I think is well-intentioned, but in some cases impractical, and could have the effect of discouraging this type of investment or infill development. Um, when you ask that similar trees be replaced in a smaller area, you may not have the use of the property that remains. Consider your own current yard and think about what it might look like if you had to replace similar trees to what we need to go in our house. And this is a, a smaller version of the same thing. 
In some cases, you may force plantings to the edge of the properties, which could impact neighbors, uh, especially over time as the trees mature. In this day and age, and concerns of food security, someone may want to plant a vegetable garden, which may not be compatible with uh, bigger trees as they mature. Um, I like the notion of looking at loss of vegetation, and I'm not, I'm not against trees. What I'm asking for is that we just allow the owners to determine what works best in our property. Um, in, in to achieve the goal of the greenhouse gases and so on, there's lots of options with hedging, vegetable patches, drought proof landscaping. There are many ways to address the issue of greenhouse gas and keep in a good capital. So if we refer to um, I believe it is the 227. Um, and the landscape guidelines, I, I would suggest that if the existing mature trees should be retained where possible, and owners should employ the principle of no net, net loss of significant plant material in any development. And end it there. Okay. Where I'm not sure where you want to come. Bottom of page 2.7. Yeah. Okay. Second point. So, so if I could ask a planner just to comment on that one, that might help. How would the planning department deal with that? The um, application that would come forward that would be removing trees, um, the standard for council would be that. Um, no net loss of significant plant material um, should be employed. So um, the idea would be that there would be something specific to the lot or the proposal that would allow for or justify the removal of significant plant material. Um, the as to if that, that significant plant material was removed, the implications would be silent. So council in determining um, uh, how they're meeting that guideline, we have the option of asking for additional plantings or accepting the owner's, the owner's statement of what they, what they intend to do. In contrast, um, if the wood is left as is, the, it then provides a two-step Process to council. First off, no net trees, uh, sorry, no significant plant materials to be to be uh, lost. So it's a should, and then no, uh, no net loss. So council looks at is there some specific development proposal or to the site that validates the moving of the trees? Then um, the next guidance is um, that there should be uh, planting uh, replacement plantings provided. And again, so that's a direction, and council can then put their mind to is there something um, unique to the site or the proposal that makes that impractical or not in the public interest. So, either way, um, council's decisions can be to have replacement plantings or not have replacement plantings. What um, the current wording does is it provides, it specifically focuses council's mind on. They have replacement plantings. So the onus is on the applicant to provide replacement plantings unless there is a reason why it's not a good idea. Yeah, that's essentially the function of the government. All right. Uh, that's clear. Um, yeah. So, just for clarification, um, as it stands now, council at least has an option to require this plant. If we remove that, we don't have that option. Otherwise, it's pretty simple. Um, it might be you would still have that option, but the onus then becomes on council to say that this is something that is necessary to offset. Whereas the existing wording, the onus is on um, the applicant to say why replacement trees should not be provided. So it's kind of putting 
What's the shoe on the different foot? Right. Okay. So can we start with the question? Sure. Um, so if we go to another tree because we're going to put the coach house in, aren't we asking them to replace that tree? Um, we're asking to replace that tree. But then, um, so what we would advise the applicant is, okay, if, if you have to remove a tree or you want to remove a tree, where is your place to plant it? Um, the applicant, so then the question goes to the applicant. The applicant then responds, there is no room for replacement plants or my existing. For example, let's say that you had uh, uh, a very small backyard and you've got a very mature fir tree. Okay. Um, and the idea being, well, that's, yes, I could replant one tree, but I don't, I don't have the um, space anymore, the root space, where I want the energy of the principal to go into the process. Then, it has the allowance yes, to have something that um, is a lower level of replacement plan that's more suitable to the So the applicant still has that ability. But again, it, it, the, the onus becomes on the applicant to show why they can't do the replacement plan. Why they, and who decides on The ultimate decision on the stress All right. Yes, and, and I think what to uh, our colleague, uh, <coughs> Director of Parks, um, and I did think it was important to key to in the replacement plan. <coughs> he, and it should be something uh, that I can paraphrase what he said, he did, um, he wanted to work quite closely with people who were looking at putting in a coach house if a tree was impacted um, so that people would not be put in a situation where they'd have to go to an arborist and, and, um, and, and take on expenses like that. He would like to uh, visit sites where trees are impacted and he would advise on um, if there is a suitable place to put a replacement tree. And he is going to look at a range of trees that would be suitable rather than just you took down the Douglas fir and you took another Douglas fir, so looking at options that people could go to. So I think that that leads in very well to uh, what our planner was saying that um, you know, if Al goes out and there really is no place that you could put a tree without impacting the surrounding neighborhood or your own property, then that can come back to council and um, we can waive that requirement because it's, it's um, obviously another suitable location. But Al was very clear that he would like to work with the individual applicants and, uh, and, and look at the, um, the situation one of the individual situations. So he, he did feel it was important to keep that in and to be asking that question. Well, I know from experience how unworkable this can be at times because you know, the little project that I'm just in the midst of completing, where uh, the plantings that are required by the town, putting six fir trees in, and our landscape architect just had a bird about it because she said the site's not suitable for that many fir trees. On a, on a, you know, it's too tight. You know, it's, it's fine for the first few years, but you know, a fir tree grows, you know, in 15, 20 years, it can be 40 feet high. And when you're trying to squeeze six trees in on a tight site, you know, however, our, our you know, and I think the world of Al Fraser, but he has a different opinion. You know, he, he thinks that, uh, you know, that they're fine. But then, you know, a, a drip line of a mature fir tree is about 40 feet across. You know, it's huge. And when you, you know, if you, if you take out trees out of your backyard and you plunk in a, in a, a, a coach house, and then you go to the plant fir trees on your property, that in 10 or 15 years are going to be fair sized tree. I, you know, I just don't think it's a workable solution. And I mean, it's, if we want to keep fir trees in our community, I think that the council is going to have to have a Another idea. Uh, <laughs> 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 
I've actually put a lot of thought into this too, and, and you know, one of the things that I think is one of the charming aspects of our town is that we have such a great tree canopy. But you know, having said that, Tom's point is 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 very valid too, in that you know, I, I think of my own yard and I think, boy, you had three trees stuck in there, it would be awful back there. It just wouldn't, you know, it would ruin the ambience of the yard. So I come up with what I hope is a motion that would be a compromise position that hopefully you can all live with. And the motion reads is when a tree is to be replaced under our current practices, then an option be given to pay $100 per tree to a fund. And that any landowner in the town of Comox could get a certificate at the nursery of the town's choosing for a maximum of two trees. And that the town would reserve the right to use this fund to plant trees as needed. So, um, well, I'll, I'll wait to see if someone seconds me. Sorry, is this specific to Coach? Uh, well, I suppose it could be, yes. It, it's really more about, about uh, trees in general, but sure, if we're talking about Coach and we can make it happen. So how would you incorporate that into this funded by Lime Street Development? We're talking about development permit and Lime Street Development, yes. Mm -hmm. um, not sure how you could do that um, there. But uh, I, I, you know, I guess the question I have, and the motion doesn't make a second to quite yet, but um, my understanding is that the way the wording is now, it's not necessarily for a preferred or maple for maple or what have you. Maybe the planning department can comment on that aspect uh, in general terms and how you deal with that worry. Um, we would seek um, guidance from council. Um, the, so to date, um, what's happened is the where we've gone out, gone in, and um, had recent applications has been the areas of existing um, mature fir trees. Um, we noticed that um, surrounding population at times of rezoning has um, raised the risk of ecological slopes of fir trees. Um, so we've, in terms of looking at it, have looked at it in terms of this, it physically can it fit on a property and. That has been sort of the fundamental issue as opposed to what is the implication in terms of shade, how much shade you can get in your backyard or non shade in your backyard. So we've been looking very much at sort of the existing characteristic of the site and trying to maintain that and fit houses within it. Um, the, and to date, we've seen um, that sort of approach um, appear to. Um, meet with council's approval. Yeah. If council gave direction through approvals or you know, resolutions in terms of that um, we should be giving more emphasis to less emphasis to sort of natural habitat. The other reason we look at four trees at this point I'll say natural habitat for eagles um, they think for eagles. That uh, we should be giving more emphasis on in terms of replacement plantings on things such as um, DLA penetration in open space, um, then we would simply accommodate that uh, in our next review. And that, so what we are trying to do is we're trying to gauge both the community and the council, and ultimately council, uh, so that they interpret what the community's wishes, in terms of how, how strong we go on with any of those aspects, um, with the idea that council at any time, if we're not in line, and of course, give direction on a specific application. So, of course, this is set up some guidelines and deal with specifics. Go ahead, Tim. It's funny, you, you talk about shade in the same breath, you talk about a fir tree. A mature fir tree offers no shade for the homeowner, it shades everybody for two blocks away because you know, there's not a branch from the first 60 feet on a mature fir tree. So you're not, uh, you know, they're not particularly attractive in, in that sense either. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, Councillor Grant's idea has some merit, and, and maybe just rework it a bit. If we want to keep fir trees in our community for eagles' nests and what have you, you know, let's find suitable places to plant fir trees back in our community, and maybe that fund could be used to, to finance that. But uh, 
you know, taking a pear tree out of a residential neighborhood, and I, I can tell you from in my experience, all your neighbors love you when you take down those big mature pear trees because they fill their gutters and they shade their kitchen windows for a block away. So, you know, I, I'm wondering if you know that's something we should investigate. We want to keep pear trees, let's find suitable places for them, not necessarily where they were taken. I guess my sense of it at this time is <laughs> use a phrase like this, probably missing the forest for the trees here, but we're 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 talking about coach houses. What Councillor Ken Grant's talking about is perhaps a more general policy. I do understand that we'll be looking at a tree protection bylaw at some point in the near future. That may be an area to look at. Uh, that kind of program. Of course, some developments of all kinds you always are dealing with trees, and that may be an option to consider for developments as a whole. <coughs> I guess for the specific coach house requirement, the language that's being proposed here, and keep in mind this uh, still has to go through the public hearing and we have to deal with comments from the public on, on these guidelines as well as the amendments and the bylaw. So we may get other ideas from the public, of course, on this issue. Um, so I guess when I'm, you know, we've got Councillor Swift's comments about taking out this wording, and some discussion on that, and we'll have potentially another motion. Um, around the, uh, the dollar amount and coupon program and so on. Uh, I guess where does council want to deal with this issue as it pertains to coach houses? This was some specific comments on the wording of the guidelines and then uh, another idea on maybe a more general application. So, so my thought on this um, actual motion was to be more general for building in general. Mm -hmm. But the reason why I thought it would fit in the coach house thing is because we're doing it now and we're, we're dealing with a tree issue here or, or with vegetation issue here now. And it may be something that if we put in here, we might be able to get the feedback uh, as we go. That, that, was, that was my thoughts. Um, and it seemed to fit because we were kind of doing that with the coach house thing. Although you are correct, it, for me, it, it's more of a general thing. Um, you know, I'm certainly not stuck on hundred dollars per tree. That's a number I, I came up with. Um, that seemed like an appropriate number for me. You know, we, we can certainly talk about those kinds of things. That wasn't my intention. Um, but the intention here was to get um, so that if people did want trees, they could get them. I don't see. I don't think we have any net loss. In, and as Maureen, we have loss of trees because people can come and use them in our town. And um, the other thing that Maureen pointed out was, you know, the golf course is going to lose some 40 trees because of uh, damage, their damage will need to be replaced. We could certainly use this fund to help replace some of them. like using the golf course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As an example, <laughs> we're probably not going to schedule a public hearing on this till sometime in September. Yeah. You know, usually and you know, so I don't see any sense of urgency to the, to pass this tonight. I wonder if we can't refer this back to staff to take in the comments of Councillor Grant as well as Councillor Swiss. Uh, well, I, on this last yeah, and I, I think that may be a valid point. But also, this is you know, we haven't had any motions yet uh, seconded at this point, so it's up to council as to how they proceed. Um, to go through with these amendments and to establish some sort of public hearing process. I do believe staff will uh, move forward on this uh, relatively soon so that it can be uh, established in the fall and that you know, further comments can be obtained. And I do understand that perhaps there's some applicants in the waiting room in this uh, category too. So, um, so the, the referral motion at this point, just to refer it to the next meeting, just so staff can come back with some. some you know, yeah, I guess we, we need to know what it is that you want staff to do. I think that's what I see all the way to know. Yes, I, I think that as, as the planner pointed out, so past council approvals with developments so have we've taken that in a certain council direction as, as how we are proceeding. Uh, what we're sensing and hearing right now are a couple of different ideas that are on the table, but there's no clear direction so as to at least what we should consider the question. And in fact, the committee as a whole, when we had this discussion previously, I'm not specific to Council Green Grant's idea that Council would be resolved to proceed with this 
this means that you have to say that that will be a decision tonight at council, but that was what the committee decided. So, uh, what's your pleasure, council? So, I have copies of this proposed motion that people would like to. Well, do you have a second or so? So, they, well, sure. Okay, so we'll pass it around and we'll amend it. No one that it's still out. So that's been moved and seconded as per the wording that we're going to pass around. And uh, Councillor McKinnon, we're going to have the floor. Yes, yeah, so and I guess well, don't they be positive intentions to, from Councillor Smith and Councillor Grant here. And uh, I, I was uh, shown this motion just shortly before the meeting here. Um, I also um, wonder if it would be wise for us to to hear back from staff, and, uh, including Al Fraser, in regards to uh, uh, it, from his experience, to, um, how this might play out uh, as far as policy goes. And uh, he, certainly his experience is valuable for me as a senior. But then I, I, uh, off, the, off the cuff, I like the intention, uh, but I'd like, to, I'd like to hear back from staff. Well, there's one motion now on the floor that's before you and the wording that's presented. So uh, that motion can either be passed, to be defeated, to be referred. I would suggest referring the motion to the committee. The referral motion would be to a subsequent meeting on the council. However, there would be no work really done by council or by staff on this until the council made a decision. So, if you want staff to um, deal with this issue, uh, you have to pass this or not. But referring it, it doesn't really do anything. Um, yeah, I think this is a very complex issue myself, and the way this motion is written, it would apply to all our practices of uh, tree replacement. And um, we have just invested money in our urban forest plan, and we actually should be very impressed in our community that we have a tree cover that many communities aspire to, they target to, they hope to get to. Um, and I won't go into all the benefits, I think we all know the benefits of why we aspire to that. And we also know that the majority of those trees are on private lands, and basically the tree protection bylaw we have now, there's very little protection on them. So I think one of the approaches in the planning department, I think it could be commended too, is just to look at where we can get some, um, when we do have some influence, looking at using it. And, um, you know, trees, I mean, it, there, there is a scientific study that actually values trees, that you can actually work out the values of trees, and they can be Hundred, yeah, they can be like fifty, sixty thousand dollars a mature tree. The value that's placed on it, it's not my personal valuation. It's it's a scientific how you work the whole parameters. So to say that you could take a tree down and give a hundred dollars, and somebody could come along and you just put your new house on your new subdivision and you need a couple of trees to go in the backyard that you'd be buying anyway, I. I just don't see how it would, I think it's just far more complicated than that. So I'd certainly, uh, so I would support this motion myself. Um, I certainly think, you know, we, sh we should be talking to our planning department and to Al Fraser. I know Al's given a lot of thought to this with regard to coach houses, and he is looking at, you know, stepping back from a Douglas fir is the iconic tree, and, and often, I think, being well brought up in, in this, the subdivision perhaps isn't appropriate. So he is looking at native trees that would be appropriate in, in setting. So I think he's given a good deal of thought to it. So I think I think it'd be good to, to hear from him how he can see that this is workable. And I'd be reluctant to give up this control. All right, can. that sounds so can. Okay, so the motion actually reads when a tree has to be replaced under our current practices. So that would be when you're building and you're interrupting with roots. Like when you did yours, how many trees were replaced? Three, I think. This isn't saying go and knock all your trees down and replace it with a little one or give us a hundred bucks. This is when it's within the building envelope and it's one of those ones that has to be replaced. So that's what the motion says. And that was that was the intention of it when I wrote it was not to say you want to cut your whole garden, your whole lot or whatever you want, and, 
and give them 100 bucks a tree. This is specifically for when you're putting out the coach house or if you're building on your property and that tree is one of the replacement ones. Any other comments? Um, go ahead, Tom. For clarification, when we did that uh, urban forestry plan, they only inventoried the trees on public property, didn't they? They didn't inventory. They did not inventory private, but they did uh, they do indicate that as a whole, it sounds like a 50% tree cut on private property. They didn't count all the trees on the public property. But even when they, when they talked about the urban canopy, mm -hmm. they were talking about the trees on public land. I think when they include when they talk when they compare this to every uh, I think it was including the whole town to be around fifty percent. In any event, uh, you know, I understand what Councillor Grant is driving at here and I can see some merit to discussing it, but personally in terms of the coach house arrangement, I, I don't see how quick it fits at the moment. My sense of it, and I could be wrong in this, is that that's something we should be discussing as part of the tree protection bylaw when it comes forward. Um, and I think that we need to move forward on the coach house procedures to get it to a public hearing and no doubt hear more from the public on it. And to have you know them presented with the wording as set out in the landscape guidelines and the other from uh, development guidelines. Um, you know, the public does care about trees, both private and public. Um, certainly, that's an attribute of the community. I do see some sympathetic views, however, towards the concern about like trees for like trees, and what Councillor Tom Dunn is saying about fir trees, I can certainly sympathize with. I suppose. Uh, I, I see. A, I guess I see a problem with putting this particular motion in connection with coach houses, and that was part of what Price, uh, Councilor Price, has said uh, you know, the value of the trees can be anywhere from zero to whatever, um, and it's going to be arbitrary whatever number you have to uh, give to it. You know, at this point, I suppose if somebody wanted to do a coach house, they're thinking about it. The first thing they might want to do is. Cut some trees down there yeah. without having made an application. So that's where I sit on it. And I see other hands here. So go ahead. Tom, first thing. If we were to pass this with the wording the way it is, and I believe that this wording is probably the right. wording the time. Oh, uh, under, under the landscape two, guidelines? Under yeah. the landscape guidelines. I'm not talking about the motion. No, no, I'm not talking about uh, Councilor Grant's motion at all. I believe this wording is roughly or exactly the same as the wording for residential infill, is it not? Correct. Yes. So we've already passed that by law, mm -hmm. and if we pass this coach house by law, and at, at subsequent uh, committee of the whole meetings, we start discussing this motion along with the whole tree cutting by law, and if we pass that in the future, I'm sure the wording will the staff is going to have to come back and change the wording in both the infill and coach housing and well, whatever. Yeah. You know, well, that's they, 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 they won't be anything wrong. They won't, they won't match. Would that be? What? Um, the, uh, not necessarily. The, the existing wording sets out a direction and says simply should. So, again, it's, it's putting the onus on the, on the owner to show why they have to do something. Yeah. Your council can give direction. Yes, and in terms of that existing word, if council wished tomorrow to set up a policy or a direction to staff and to say, in reviewing this, we wish you to factor into account and put greater emphasis on X, Y, and Z, um, we could easily work that into applying this <coughs> Exact existing bylaw. It's, it's more in terms of how, sorry, in this guideline, more in terms of how this guideline is interpreted and applied as opposed to um, anything else. So, if council were to say that, yes, we are, we want to see a, a more, more of an emphasis on 
um, suitability um, or whatever other parameters council wish to do, um, we would just simply take that and we would immediately apply it mm -hmm. uh, to the next application that came through. And we'd apply it across the development permits to be consistent. Okay, yeah. so um, just back to my motion. You were talking, you and Barbara Price both talked about the value of trees and how expensive they can be. The motion reads that when it's asked to be replaced, those trees are being replaced anyway. That's why I came up with a price of $100. It could be more than 100 it could be less. I don't know <clears throat> the actual guidelines between like you don't go and, and knock down a fifteen thousand dollar tree and replace it with a fifteen thousand dollar tree now. So this would only apply to those that are being replaced. So I don't know what what a tree. I mean, you bought some for yours. Uh, is hundred bucks a reasonable amount for me? A meter and a half for a fir tree right now is uh, to replace is about eighty dollars. So that's what the current guidelines are: a meter and a half for two meters. Anyway, it doesn't matter. You know, I, I guess, again, focusing on your motion, but at the same time, what we're trying to get to with Coach, I was just, um, I can see that being discussed as part of the tree protection bylaw, and this could apply to developments as a whole. Um, we don't know what we're going to get for Coach Houses at this point. Obviously, that needs to be seen. We want to see what happens with them. There are guidelines here that the wording stands that it is will be interpreted. Subject always, though, to a specific application from the court and council in the direction in that regard. Um, you know, introducing this kind of concept certainly adds a whole other level of discussion to it, um, which may make sense in some cases and may make not make sense in others. And I, I have a hard time dealing with both issues at the same time. So I would. Uh, okay. Oh, sorry. I, I was just going to say, um, I know I know we're sort of thinking this on a, on a bigger level, but I'm wondering if this wouldn't be a good place to sort of have a trial balloon in terms of how this goes and how many people do exercise this option in terms of um, trees rather than actually place them on their property. So this might be a way to. See how the attitude towards it is it's reflected uh, in the microphone rather than in the community as a whole. So, might be a good way to try yeah, it out. I suppose that's true, but we would yet to see a form of application for a coach house. So, we don't know whether this is an issue that potentially be as a sort of uh, for development. Yeah, but I think, sorry, what I think we're trying to do is encouraging for development. So, if we. Yes. You know, this might be a way of encouraging it and allowing it. And, you know, maybe the transformation, maybe not. I, I would just like the owner to have the option and the tree itself not to be the option or not to be an obstacle to the inflow development, and yet the tree is still to be retained in some form or the vegetation to be retained. All right, well, we've heard lots of different comments on it. Anything uh, further on Council uh, So, um, I would, uh, you know, I'm not adverse to hearing staff's uh, recommendations and having, having them look at it. And if we if you would like this to be reworded, and it's, if there's some way of rewording it, I'm not sure how to do it, that they could have a look at this and bring us back recommendations or, or whatever at our next meeting. I'm certainly not adverse to that. Um, I'm not sure how we. Would we reword that, or perhaps they could just do that as well? Of course. Yeah, I mean, the general difficulty is um, you're referring it to in the context of coach houses, fair enough to understand that. Um, but I think it's more of a bylaw of general application. You may wish to consider referring it to, as I say, the tree protection bylaw discussion, which will come before in the next number of months. Um, in the meantime, then coach house. Materials can go forward to public hearing, and then if we get a great, you know, groundswell of support for something as you suggested here, then uh, we could certainly bring it to that discussion as well. Because we're obviously not approving the final form of coach house bylaws at this point. So, okay, so a couple so options. So, um, what you're saying is we could refer this to our tree protection bylaw, 
or refer it to staff to bring it back under the discussion uh, under the work plan and uh, the protection by law. It wouldn't have been passed necessarily. Well, but but, but the concept at least the discussion we can have to that, that wording when we get to staff. Mm -hmm. Your Worship, if you want someone to set it off the table until we have the tree protection bylaw discussions, and uh, I think the intentions are good. To yeah, referring to table is the same thing. So, is there a second for that? Okay, on that, it's uh, not really available, so it's just time and place. So, we'll go back to staff. Uh, just give me an indication, staff, for when that tree protection bylaw might come forward, the number of months. You know, it's on your work plan. Mm, yes, I don't know if it's next year or the year after. 2014. 2014. Okay. All right. So there you go with the timing and anything else. Yes. See ya. Just in terms of the discussion on, on the landscaping issue on, on forest houses, um, as it is a guideline, and if the interpretation of the guideline by staff for a forest house application, if we were to see that it was sterilizing or prohibiting coach house applications from going through. That would be a signal to us that it requires an immediate advised council as such. That this this isn't workable for the applicant and somehow we need to amend it. And so I think maybe that might uh, allay some of the concerns or fears that councillor Swift and others can have on this. But we shouldn't well I think by adding the word size type suitability on the tree. And we have a motion to refer in the field. Any further on referral? Seeing none, all in favor? That's going to be referred now back to the board. We don't have any motions yet on the uh, OCP amendments for first reading and the zoning bylaw amendments for first and second. I'm so moved. So OCP amendment bylaw 1752 for first reading has been moved. Seconder, please. Thank you. Discussion. Go ahead. I would just like to amend under the uh, landscaping guidelines under item number two, where it talks about existing mature trees. Just in the second last line, it says replacement plants should be provided of a sufficient number, size, type, comma, suitability, comma, and maturity to also be removed. So we're adding the word suitability. Thank you. Is there a second for that comment? Seconded. Okay. Any discussion on that? I missed the fine point. So, what was the suitability? Just adding suitability. Okay. Yeah. okay. Any further discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor of the amendment? Motion is carried. So, as amended for first reading, any further discussion on the OCP amendment bylaw? Seeing none, all those in favor? Motion is carried. Thank you, Council, for that part of it. Uh, we also have the second motion uh, having to consider the impact on the current financial plan from the waste management plan. From the management plan, we'll see pay on the second. Second, second. All in favor? Motion is carried. And the only bylaw amendment we get 1752 to be in the first and second readings. Second. In favor? Motion is carried. Council received a coach on zoning strategy as contained in attachment two. Second. Those in favor? Motion is carried. A public hearing be scheduled for bylaw 1752 and 1753. Second. It won't be till September the earliest, correct? Thank you. Those in favor? Motion is carried. And that development application is proceeding and then left to bylaw 1752. Second. Second. In favor? I'll see you. Let's see the trees here. <laughs> All right, good work. Uh, 239 is correspondence, so that's the uh, This is a letter uh, via this regional district, Pouch uh, and Valley. This is a college it was on the investment agriculture farm tour, and this issue came up. And I believe that the CDO, the local regional district, has passed the bylaw. This is more just for information. I don't think we necessarily need that. The district passed one. We need to necessarily add your support to that. Perhaps uh, Councilor Fletcher can comment. Yeah, yesterday's meeting, we passed a resolution to support the bylaw. Yeah. Okay. All right. 
Okay, so that's fine by me. Uh, motion received to be on it. Move received. Second. Second. All in favor? Motion carried. A letter from Elizabeth Bell for in regards to the new blue strategy. Again, see here the ones are dealing with three other elements. So motion received to be on it. Second. In favor? Motion carried. The letter from the Code of Writers and Works Center Club for the special events permit for September 8th. Move received on grant request. Second. Discussion. All in favor? Motion carried. Letter from the BIA for months by the C looking for a permit to approve his first year close for months out for student life. Sunday, August 4th. Um, I don't know exactly what time, but uh, you know, that's what coming up. Um, I think that'd be the 10th floor. So, if I would move receipt and one ground for request, okay, and it's consecutive, uh, any issues from staff other than the reason? Okay, all in favor, motion's carried. And lastly, correspondence uh, from a uh, dearly departed friend, Jim Brass, uh, as president of the Society. And we did that last year and we haven't had anybody really know should be approved. I would uh, move receive and grant the request. Second. Second. All those in favor? <laughs> the late item uh, before we deal with the reports from members of council, uh, this is from our director of finance uh, seeking the council's waiver and policy to authorize staff to invest six million dollars in containers for now, 1.61% down the year. I'll move that on recommendation. Discussion. Just one question. I noticed that the interest rate that we could get at Raymond James is higher, um, and yet you're recommending that we go with Western Canadian Bank. Could, could there be a risk tolerance issue there? Or? Council's investment policy, which you will find attached uh, on the final page of the agenda, uh, doesn't contemplate us investing in any credit unions. Um, they are allowed by the community charter. Uh, but it's someplace we haven't gone yet. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't read that correctly. Okay, fair enough, thanks. Mm -hmm. Any further? Those in favor? All right, those better all in place. <laughs> <laughs> Just the best. Okay, so reports from members of council. Mm -hmm. No particular order, because uh, it's been some time. Um, just today, I went to visit the organic uh, composting place um, tournament at the stump, and we also had a side trip to the Antara place for the recycling. So that was really interesting. And I had a ride in a uh, beautiful town vehicle driven by Councillor McKinnon. Um, I attended the Filter board meeting. I attended the Watkins Greenway official opening. I attended the opening of the art gallery June 28th. I attended a meeting on the Establishment of Culture Day in September. I attended the Immigration Roundtable. Uh, I attended the Impossible Bird concert, uh, which is the first in a series of filler concerts. The second one is occurring tomorrow night. Get your tickets, you can do it online. David and Mary. Uh, I attended the Tea and Conversation at the Museum honoring the hospital's uh, 100th anniversary and the St. Joseph Hospital Gala and the Sewer Commission. Councilor Price? Yes, I was at the AGM of the Cyprian Theatre. Mm -hmm. I attended the uh, Last Public Hearing and um, attended the Co-op Archives and Museum Society monthly meeting. I met uh, Richard Group along with the Council of Chapter who was going to restore Matalani's house. I visited the transit demonstration bus at Tomac Mall and I attended the CYMC classical finale. Councilor Yes, I attended the, the last public hearing this fall, the Vanier grad in that the town, the art gallery opening. Um, and I participated in the Minute Canada Parade in Portland and the multicultural booth. And I attended the Immigration Roundtable with Councillor Andrew Preston. And my son was married in Vancouver, attended Vancouver Island Music Fest, which was uh, 1,200 volunteers, a great community event. 
uh, attended the tour of the waste management facilities in, in Cumberland today, and uh, regretfully report that uh, we're not at the race. The soapbox derby has been cancelled this year uh, due to the edgy road work, which is still in progress. I'm not here anymore, but we're hoping to have it either at a later date or certainly next year. That's my report. Thank you, guys. Take way back to June 8th, as I was absent, and I'm June 19th of my last report. And uh, takes us back to uh, the grand opening of the CIBC Bank in Portland at Crown Isle. I attended the Crown Isle at Crown Isle. I attended the Columbus Valley Art Gallery exhibit at uh, Elevate the Arts as well. June 9th, I attended the Scottish Army Cadet ceremonial review on Crown uh, Isle. I love the bagpipes. There's lots of bagpipes in that. Uh, on June 10th, I attended the Highland School Bursary Awards and presented to my husband our final award to a lovely young lady named May Ackert. And on June 11th, I attended the CPRD Water Hold. June 13th, we decided to waste and we had a meeting. Uh, June 24th, I attended the Civilian CGN on behalf of your eyes and uh, the annual report of the Board meeting on the 26th, the dark day as a whole in the public hearing. And on July 5th, I attended the Comox New DMT, which celebrated St. Joseph's Hospital's 100th years. And uh, it was a wonderful exhibit. Uh, and she was a patient Daniel through the exhibit and was extremely pleased to see the recognition the hospital has in the uh, And again, on the uh, July 7th, I attended the annual St. Joseph's Hospital Garden Park. And the 8th, we had an Uncle Day's meeting, and everything was going extremely well. And fortunately, the soapbox derby will be canceled due to the road work, but um, everything else is, is looking really good. And uh, uh, they're still looking for members of council to perhaps help out with emceeing events uh, or in the uh, info booths. So if you're interested and available, please contact both. And yesterday, I attended the regional district sewage, public water, and um, yeah, I um, attended an economic development meeting, and uh, although it was an official meeting, I have been uh, working with the BIA and their coordinator regarding our self-guided walking tours, and we'll be, um, the brochure is made, we're going to have the kickoff at the Comox uh, Golf Club at uh, 5.30 on July 23rd, and Council and media are certainly uh, invited to come and have a look. Um, Hoping that it's going to be uh, something that will draw lots of tourists in from other towns so we can take advantage of. So. Okay. Uh, I attended a uh, <coughs> district board meeting last month, so it was the management meeting last month. Yesterday I chaired the city commission meeting and the water committee meeting, and was at a community the whole of the weekend. Great, thanks. Uh, since I was last here, I met with Mayor St. Superintendent Randy Wilson, who's doing his semi-annual visit. I was invited to and attended the Cabinet Appoints appointments announcement over in Vancouver back in June. And uh, greeted the new Cabinet posts that are relevant to our particular uh, uh, area of interest in terms of Aboriginal affairs and local government and environment, etc. <laughs> Dan all 360 is here in June and we're participating in the award ceremony. The Boomer Legacy Ride on Mary's Wheel in Melanie on day two and with the survival tale. Showing down was a lot more fun than doing that, but we tell you. Participating in the Investment Agricultural Foundation tour and dinner, and that's uh, some of that information from the floor this evening. Missed the last council meeting, I was helping raise funds at the St. Joseph's Golf Tournament. Did an interview with the Air Cadets here locally. They're hoping to get Rick Mercer to be their main officer, so they have a video uh, request to stay in that. See that said we're going to have a meeting at uh, uh, Deep Bay, and that's a good event. Good to see that Shellfish Research Station up and running. National Aboriginal Day is celebrated now in the reserve, but also at the Magic Thunder Center. Went to Powell River for the symphony on the 22nd on the vacation of uh, Paul Summers. And there's over 400 people on the ferry that went over that day to see that event. And it's always a great uh, event. And we'll post a photo of that on the Castle Street Powell River. 
Our friend Greenway opening is mentioned the Mark Iskwell grads at Public Hearing. Met with the gentleman from the local Shriners <coughs> Club and interested in that. He's got some ideas on something along the lines of what Councillor and Grant so let's refer to around trees in terms of the donation program. So uh, I referred him off to Al Fraser and I understand that Al is here at least one discussion. So that's what I'll come for. CAO, Fire Chief, and myself hosted the Select uh, Fire Home Committee from City of Courtney at the Fire Training Center here uh, on July 8th and uh, put them through their pieces. Um, we didn't lock up anyone in confined spaces, but we did show them all the bells and whistles here we had at the excellent Fire Training Center. And I learned very quickly that I would never make a good firefighter because A, I don't like heights, and B, I don't like confined spaces. So, <laughs> I, I kind of got up to the top of that tower, the five-story tower, is it? And I uh, looked down and got right back down the stairs. <laughs> Great view from up there, but uh, I couldn't let the fire horses up there and then climb up the ladder. Uh, the Air Maintenance Squadron had their uh, change of command. Major Chris Shafter is leaving, and uh, Major Brian Kingham is the uh, new incoming uh, commander in charge of that important. Air Maintenance Squadron, and of course, our own John Ramis is the Army Colonel. He was there, and his wife came over, so it was great to see him. So that's my report. So, uh, media questions? Any at this time? Just wanted to clarify just the, yeah. um, the OCP amendment by 172. It, it was passed as an amendment, is that correct? First and second meeting, yes. Okay, with the suitability. Yeah. All right. Uh, no other questions, no public here. We do have uh, an internal meeting this evening, so a motion to exclude the public under section 90 of the community charter zone. So, in favor? So, we'll agree with the general order.